surge of migrants into the United States continues. Officials reporting a record pace for families crossing the southern border in August. And now cities like El Paso say they are at the breaking point, unable to serve so many people seeking a new life in America. This morning we get some perspective on this crucial issue from the former, former Border Patrol chief in the very busy Yuma sector. Chris Clem joins us on Close Up. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Here. So I'm interested, you know, so often this issue gets filtered through a partisan lens, you know, and people go into their camps and they get all up in arms about it. But you've been there. You've seen what's going on. Give us some context of how different uh, what is happening now versus what you saw 25 years ago when you first started. Well, a great question, and it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Securing America's borders should be an American issue. Without border security, every border town, every border state is, you know, every, every, it becomes, every state becomes a border state is what I'm trying to say. Um, over the, my entire career, I did it for 27 and a half years. The first 25, I'll tell you, every administration I worked for, we made progress towards securing the border, you know, making things better for the American people and making be things better for the migrants that had crossed illegally. For some reason, I think just really, you know, out of spite, everything was kind of taken away from us. We had a system in place, wall, infrastructure, technology, policies to secure the border, one of the best times of my career. And then it's kind of been taken away from us. And you're seeing it as a result of the numbers. The numbers tell the story. We went from just over 400,000 arrests in 2020 to 1.6 million to 2.2 million, and we're trending to close to over 2 million arrests this year. Um, it's really changed, and the demographics have changed. What used to be a Mexican national and Central American problem is now a global problem. In Yuma, the last place where I worked before I retired as chief, uh, 116 different countries were coming in. Oftentimes, Mexico and Central America didn't even make my top 10 countries. Yeah, explain what's going on there. Who is bringing all of these people to Mexico to get them across the border? It, the, the smuggling organizations, the cartel, it, it, they are commodity neutral. It's about making money. And because we don't have strong policies right now on our immigration and border security, it is uh, um, making the, the situation right for human exploitation. So people are paying, paying into cartels to get smuggled into the United States and they're flying in from all over the world to Mexico City and then to our southern border or Mexico's northern border and, and coming in illegally and it's, it's burdening our border patrol agents. They're having to respond to groups of 100, 200 and you've seen recently on some reports thousand people showing up within a matter of hours. Um, that's taken all our enforcement resources that should be patrolling the, border, patrolling the border, making America safe. Um, they're dealing with processing and, and handling migrants. And that's allowing the Degataways. We don't talk about the Degataways. Those are people that we know have entered, but we don't know who they are or where they ended up. And I can just tell you, that's where the criminals, that's where the potential terrorists are, that's where your drug smugglers are. Look, there, there was information put out so far this year, over 2,700 pounds of fentanyl has been seized by the U.S. Border Patrol this year alone. I mean, again, this is what happens with zero consequences and policies that are not effective is it creates vulnerabilities for the American people, the American public. Yeah, well, we heard from the head of Border Patrol recently that the U.S. does not have operational control of its southern border. What does that mean in reality? So operation control was when we had, we had the, the upper hand on the issues going on at the border. We always looked at a, at a high effectiveness rate of 90%. 90% is an A. We, we understand we're dealing with people. We, we can't get everything. But we'd have a good sense of identifying, classifying, responding, and resolving issues at the border. That was operational control. And for the most part, a lot of our areas where we had infrastructure, and by infrastructure I mean wall, access roads, technology, where we had that in place, backed by strong policies, we had a good sense of control. I could tell you who and what was coming in. But when those things are taken away from us, we start losing control, we start losing our effectiveness, and that, that creates a vulnerability for the country. In the sector where you were chief, uh, we know that obviously President Trump wanted to build a wall. It wasn't fully completed, so there are essentially empty sections. There, there's a wall and then there's not. Yes, yes, so we, we were moving. I, I was very fortunate to inherit a lot of that uh, uh, wall that was constructed under, under uh, President Trump. There was gaps where contracts ended and where they were continuing, or there were some little nuances because of the way the border was, who owned the land, and so that just was basically him a beacon for the migrants to come in. So you had miles and miles of wall, and then there would be a 400, 500 foot gap. The problem is, is a lot of that, it was right there along the Colorado River, and water, smugglers, nighttime migrants doesn't mix. And so we were putting a lot of people at risk. And so closing those gaps was a huge deterrent. And again, for people that don't always get it, 
walls where they uh, need to be deployed and, and installed where they make sense where the border patrol agents say we need that because they're designed to impede and deny entry and control and contain entry we still need agents we still need the backing of the technology and we still need the strong policy so when we catch you we can remove you, get you in front of a judge and get you removed or criminally prosecute you. But yeah, so where there's gaps, there are literally pallets of steel and infrastructure materials like uh, cable, um, uh, uh, cameras, things like that that were never installed, sitting there. And, um, and that, again, creates a vulnerability for, for the border and for the American people. The end of Title 42 earlier this year didn't correspond with the, the massive surge in migrants immediately that many people thought would be seen. Why do you think that was? Yeah, I, I, I actually, you know, had, had, a, you know, had some good thoughts on that. First of all, let me tell you why. Because Border Patrol was involved. We have been planning since the day Title 42 was implemented uh, on contingency. That's what law enforcement do. We strategically plan of, of the, you know, how Plan A, B, and C would work and beyond. So I knew, number one, Border Patrol was involved. They were going to control any chaos. Number two, the administration had, been, you know, had, a, had enough problems on the border. They were not going to allow things to get that bad. They would be work very closely with Mexico to ensure that there would not be tens of thousands rushing the border at one time. And lastly, kind of going back to an earlier question, is the cartel. The cartel loses money if they can't control what happens at the border. So if you did have a mad rush of people arriving there that didn't pay, people would lose money. So again, most importantly, Border Patrol was involved. We were going to make sure things were under control. Number two, the administration would have to respond if chaos really ensued, or ensued after that, like more than what we're seeing now. And again, the profit, the profit loss uh, potentially for the cartel. So I woke up the next day, Friday morning in May when it ended, and there was no chaos. Numbers were down. So, uh, uh, you know, it was a pretty good hypoth hypothesis. Yeah, and you're retired now, so you can speak more broadly on yeah. this. What should be done if, you know, a major player in this is a transnational drug operation versus the Mexican government? Obviously, yeah. government to government, that's normal relations. Right. But here you have an operator and an actor in this situation situation that is controlling so much but is a criminal organization. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we definitely need to call it as we see it, right? Uh, we understand uh, that uh, you know, just like in, in the United States and any country, there's going to be bad actors playing there. Um, we need to make sure that we have policies and legislation in, uh, in writing to support you know, securing our borders, securing our country from those threats, but also making sure that we have the resources that really are readily available to deploy to support Mexico should they want to take this on. You know, and, and not just a one and done, sustain it so this entire, you know, North America can be, uh, you know, safe and or at least safer from the influence of, of narco terrorism and, and the drug cartels. And as we wrap up here, obviously there's a, a human aspect to this too. How often do you see the unaccompanied minors? That's such a, a bland term. These are children sometimes. Yes taking care of small babies, bringing them across. Well, th that's the heartbreaking part. Um, we talk about the kids a lot. Um, you know, I think there's been over, well over 100,000 unaccompanied children uh, of, uh, uh, caught at the border, and those are 17 and younger. And I'm, I'm telling you, we get them from diapers, months old to just a few years old. Uh, that, that's heartbreaking because, number one, you, you look at it and go, why would a parent do that? But sometimes the parents don't have control. The, the, the smugglers, the cartel on the south side, on the Mexican side, are splitting up the families and breaking up the families and moving kids and dropping kids in certain areas. Um, so, you know, the parents are, are basically beholden to follow through with the deal they made with the cartel. So, so that just is just horrifying that we cannot look at it just from that lens alone. Some common sense and compassion to secure this border so that we can protect the kids. Um, our agents do a great job of trying to make a, a difficult situation better for these children, but um, that's, that's heartbreaking. All right, former Border Patrol Chief Chris Clem, thank you so much for joining us here on Close Up. We appreciate it. Thank you.